Hello viewers, I'm SP and welcome back to Citizen Sleeper, uh, where as I said last time, I think what we're going to do with our upgrade points, the next thing we're going to do is unlock Obsessive Haggler. And uh, we do have a drive to buy a vial of stabilizer, but of course I would very much like to get Obsessive Haggler before we pay the 100 cryo. So let's have a quick look. I was looking through our, um, our, our list of drives here. I think this one, digging into the old Solheim networks and getting Fang the information he's looking for, is probably the easiest drive to accomplish from where we are right now, because I think we just need to give him the one more piece of data uh, that he's missing. Building a home in the low end would require um, four pieces of scrap, which is work. That's significant work. Building a ship mind ourselves requires ingratiating us with the Oort Exchange and getting fragments. That's a ton of stuff. Uh, disabling your tracker is, once again, not a thing Fang is actually going to help us with. Um, but this this is real. Fixing the Ambergris is a ways away yet. Uh, we're working on getting access to mushrooms. Getting to know Emphis is a task that's going to cost us a bunch of money, so again, it'd be cool to clear it out. Grow some mushrooms is a lot of dice yet. Yeah. Buy a vial of stabilizer um, is an expensive upgrade point. So, what was the what was the value that Feng needed? What's the other Solheim node? Okay, well, let's just throw our four at that immediately then. This network, uh, this network storage holds corporate records, most of them corrupted by a failed system purge. Most, but not all, critically. All right, let's see if this is in fact enough to earn us a point. We get a scene out of it at least. As you enter the bay, Fang is nowhere to be seen. The banks of servers and machines blink out of the dark, or blink, blink out of the dark, in staccato rhythms, unseeing eyes of the station's digital ghosts. Hey, that ship is uh, dangerously heading directly in the. Are you gonna, buddy? Buddy, are you turning? Okay, they're turn. They're gonna. All right, everything's fine. <laughs> I, w I was very worried for a moment there. Shitheads! Feng's voice echoes from behind a stack, followed by the hammer of a fist on a metal casing. These snaky shitheads! Who's snaky? Oh, sleeper! Feng's smiling head pops out from behind a stack. Just the emulated consciousness I've been eager to see. And come back here. You pick your way between the thrumming stacks, trying not to trip on the loose bundles of cables that blanket the dark floor. Fang is sat in front of a set of monitors mounted to a stack. Tell me, sleeper, what do you see here? Fang waves at a monitor, monitor to his side, glowing with pale lists of information. You lean in closer, looking for the links in the data. The tables seem to be filled with personal information. Names, genders, dates, ID numbers, all the markers of institutional records. Uh, well, I think we tend to follow people's leads in conversation. Uh, shitheads? Fang laughs. Ah, maybe not all of them, but what kind of shitheads? Well, I'm assuming Solheim, since that's the data I've been bringing you. Bingo. He taps at the terminal. I pulled these from the old data you brought in, all employees of the Eye's original owners. And, he leans past you and scrolls the list down, this one, this is a sneaky shithead. He stabs at the screen with a finger. The name reads Harden Hurst. Who is this Harden? That, says Feng, giving you a sideways look, is the thing. He drags a stool out beside him and motions for you excuse me. Motions for you to sit. There just so happens to be a Harden Hurst. In Havenage. He waits for your reaction. Oh, are you sure? Well, that's where you might be able to help me. Feng leans back in his chair. And just think about it. Decades ago, Harden worked on this station as a... Feng leans across to look at the monitor. 
Senior Strategic Operations Executive. Feng raises his eyebrows at you. I mean, that's pretty high up. Our Harden was keeping the money coming, for, uh, coming in for Solheim. He defined priority growth initiatives by making sure the extractors they contracted out to were hooked into a system that outsourced all the risk and kept all the profit. Uh, yeah, that's capitalism for you. And good old Harden shuttled thousands of Palladium Rush workers into an infrastructure which meant that their cut of the work they did went straight back into Solheim. How do you know all this? I grew up here, Sleeper. This is my history. I am a child of the Collapse. Fang turns back to his screen, staring hard at the strings of code flickering by. Now, before I was born, my parents were Solheim contractors. They ate in Solheim canteens, worked on Solheim ships. They breathed Solheim air and slept in Solheim beds. Fang's voice rises as he speaks, his, ha his hands fists on the terminal edge. And the work that paid for that existence? The cycles of hard extraction out in the belt? Solheim took their cut. This was a company town, so to speak, and my parents were just another in the long line of freelance contractors willing to risk their lives for a shot at anything other than poverty. Disposable. This guy, stabbing at Hardin once again with his finger, strategized all that, did the sums, and then somehow, thousands and thousands of cycles later, is still going. Still here, crawling in the walls like some shithead snake. He survived the revolution. Oh, okay, but sure, surely it can't be him. Fang relaxes a little. Who knows? He turns to you and smiles. So we're going to find out. Hardin is now a big shot in the shipyards, just a few degrees back around the eye from here. Fang brings up a map of the lower eye. You know, Havenage might be born out of Erlen's revolutionary zeal, but a flat hierarchy it is not. Hardin happened to float to the top. Feng zooms in on the far yards. He grimaces. And the thing is, I don't have access to those systems. The shipyard crew is pretty paranoid. They don't like anyone from systems digging around in their stuff. Plus, we need more than just the name of a Solheim executive. We need proof. Fang holds up a thumbnail-sized drive. And that's where this little creation of mine comes in. I call it a ripper worm. He turns the drive between his fingers. It'll rip through any digital storage and spin out a silken thread of filtered data. This one is set on the scent of Hardin Hurst. He hands it over. Now, getting into the compound might be tricky. Fang puts a hand on your shoulder. But you, however, have a particular knack for... Remote access? Feng grins. If you can extract yourself a Havenage cipher from a Haven Havenage agent, you know, they sometimes carry them among their data caches. You could crack open the compound's network and slot the worm in through any open port. You never even need to go near the shipyards. So, what do you say? Up for it? I mean, sure. I love to be helpful. I knew it. I knew you'd be happy to catch this snake. And don't worry, once we nail this guy, I'll, I'll start to work on your, the tracker of yours. I haven't forgotten. Feng scratches at his chin. Now, anything the worm gets, it'll send it back here to me. There's something wrong here, and I aim to get to the rotten core of it. You leave Feng digging through data among the wires and machines of the old station. As you walk out, you try to imagine the eye as it once was, a vast machine running smooth and strong, directed by people like Hardin. A vast Solheim-built machine into which thousands poured from the surrogate systems, looking for a new life. The hope of a better future, engineered to line someone else's pockets. It's an idea you are intimately familiar with. You think of Hardin still alive, still part of this place, and wonder if the past is ever truly past. Okay, we did not get drive completion there. We have, to, we have to help him a little bit more. Uh, well, fortunately, Havenage agents get hacked on twos. So, this should be very doable. I don't know exactly how far we have to push for our drive for our upgrade point, but I would like it now. That would be really good. 
All right, so we got our Havenage Cypher. We got some data we can sell. And this is our node, right? Wait, maybe not? Ah, here we go, here we go. This gate keeps traffic out of the Havenage Shipyard's internal network. Or at least, it's supposed to. All right, H4 access. And here we are, port 33, exactly the kind of place where you might drop a ripper worm. Sounds like a terrible affliction. All right, the worm slots in and begins tunneling down a thread. Godspeed, little one. Is that, is that it? Okay, I guess we're... This thing is not really like updating in real time here. Oh, there we go, complete. Hack the shipyard, slot the ripper worm. Okay, we did that. Yeah, okay, so we wait, I guess. You know, I don't have all that long to sit around, is the thing. Uh, we did get paid. Feng did, did pay us, which is helpful. Uh, we need to get more paid. This is risky, but we can throw a three at it. I'm not sure exactly how much money this makes. Let's find out. Okay, negative, I, uh, negative outcome. Stole my energy. Actually... You sleepwalk through your shift, eye on the clock. You break a glass, and the sound seems to reverberate inside your skull. Yeah, okay, I've had those shifts. Well, I guess we gotta go buy mushrooms again. Because I need... It's pretty rough. This is pretty rough. I mean, the good news is we're working on another, uh, another thing here. But I would love to not have to spend all that money to get my upgrade point. Go see Feng. No, okay. the The clock for the Ripper Worm is here. Okay, so that's just gonna take a few cycles to do its thing. Uh, we better make some money, I guess, because like even even with the thing, we're still looking at having to pay eighty uh, cryo for that next uh, that next hit of stabilizer, and we're getting we're getting to the point where like it is critical that we buy it. So let's throw a couple of fives at this bar shift. Okay, 15 cryo, two pips of good service. And we got our Thrill Seeker. That bar of energy doesn't actually do anything, but it's nice to have. So what do we want to do with the two? I mean, we could throw it in here again. It's not, you know, 75% chance we get better than the negative outcome. But even the negative outcome wouldn't be that heartbreaking in this situation because we'd still have the energy to rest. I think maybe this is exactly what we do. Well, you know what? With a two, we could go get a Havenage Cypher, though. We start working on our um, our collection for Caster because we're going to have to get a ship mind eventually if we want to help on Kita. Yeah, maybe that's a better thing to do with it. You, surrender your data to me. Do we have a drive for working at the bar? No, we do not. And unfortunately, picking up a ship mind in this way will not satisfy the build a ship mind drive. Yeah. Our next upgrade point is going to come from buying the, the stabilizer, I bet. Well, whatever, it's fine. Okay, a couple more high dice lets us get some more good work done here. That was easy enough. Just spend some time working at the bar. 
As you start your shift, a crew of salvagers barge in, and the next few hours are a whirlwind of chatter and long pours. And they tip well, which is nice. The Garol slides from the bottle into the lumpy recycled glass, a pale grassy yellow under the Overlook's warm lights. The spacer nods and takes the drink, bringing it up to their face in both hands like an offering bowl. This is the good stuff, the stuff Tala says is aged in wooden casks, stored in some closed-off part of the old station, among corroded wires and softly looping systems. Sometimes it's hard to tell if Tala's joking. Either way, you like pouring this stuff. It gets on your fingers, and if you rub, th rub them together, you can smell the mossy drink, cut through with aniseed, mushrooms, and wood as the alcohol evaporates. You like those who order it, too. The aged girl is kept beneath the bar, open to order only by those who know it's there, like the quiet spacer sitting at the bar right now, and, as always, fascinated by people. We watch the spacer. They're far enough away that you can freely watch them as, they clo uh, as you close the bottle and tuck it beneath the bar. You call them a spacer because they bear the hallmarks, pale, vac-suited, bird-boned, and hunched beneath the weight of the station's spin gravity. But the closer you look, the less you see a type. Pale eyes, almost gray, but kind. Delicate fingers that lightly drum the bar as if it was an instrument. A shock of black hair almost covering a forehead scar. Scars are something you've learned to value. They are what marks your body, for, uh, what marks out your body from the hundreds, or maybe thousands, who knows, of similar models that rolled out of SNARP's bio labs. You find yourself rubbing one on your forearm, a rough little split, something that on good days you might think of as a mark of defiance. Suddenly, you hear a heavy clunking at the door. It creaks open, and a huge cylindrical metal tank tumbles through, slamming into the floor. Oh, shit! Tala breezes in from behind it, a whirl of hair and bright eyes. Shit, shit, shit! Tala? The sleeper! She ducks behind the bar and comes over. Can you help me with this? You look at the huge metal tank suspiciously. Uh, yep, I'm coming. On it. We don't ask questions, we just help. You come around the bar and get to one side of the tank. Okay, says Tala. On my count. One, two, three. You both heave the tank up to standing. Somehow. You hold it in place, struggling to keep it steady. So, where's this going? In the back comes a voice from behind the tank. Somehow you manage to lug the huge thing into the back room, where you place it in one corner, dwarfing the rest of the contents in the cramped space. As you do, you hear a crunch. You stand back and look at the expired rations oozing out from under the tank. Oh, shit. Tala looks at you apologetically. I know you liked those. Uh, no, I didn't really. I'm, I'm going to just say that's okay. I never, we never took the rations. L listen, there's lots of food on the station. I'll be fine. You push the crushed rations to one side. That's the end of that. Tala looks exhausted and rubs her shoulders. Francis, I swear to... Francis? This is a person we don't know. You, Francis, I mentioned him already. My guy on the door deals with suppliers. Tall? She sighs. He was supposed to be back from Etienne's up in the Greenway by now. Back with our Garol. She leans against the tank. Ah, uh, seems like he's lo got lost again. Or joined the Haifa commune. Well, we need that Garol. There's four other bars near here, and the spacers sure as hell don't come to the Overlook for the ambiance. She looks through the open door to check if anyone can hear her. She knocks on the hollow tank. So, I'm taking matters into my own hands. She smiles. Welcome, sleeper, to the Overlook Distillery. You look around the dank back room. I... I think this is going to need some work. She picks at some paint flaking from the metal walls. Well... I might need some help, though, she shrugs. Uh, you up for it? Could be fun. Uh, yeah, happy to help. <laughs> As always, that's kind of my thing. Okay. She grabs you by the shoulders. I'm excited. She turns around and looks at the tank. See, I reckon we chop this thing in half, one half for fermentation, the other we turn into a still. 
Uh, we're also going to need to gather gather the ingredients. She turns back and looks at you. You look more like a chopper than a gatherer. That's probably fair. So how about you build the still and tub while I work on the rest? Oh, wait, sleeper, I have an idea. Tal is grinning now, and it's making you nervous. Uh, to make up for the rations, how about we put a kitchen in here, too? Will that fit? Are we going to have room for that? Ah, we'll make it work. She turns back to the tank. This is going to be great, she says to herself. You look at the dented ta tank and the bare room. You know, at least she has vision. Tala nudges you out of the back room and closes the door. As you go back to the bar, you hear the banging and thumping begin. The spacer finishes up their drink and nods in your direction as they leave. You can't quite tell if it's a gesture of sympathy or good luck. So much for a quiet shift. Okay, so we got ourselves a new drive to help improve the overlook. Build a distillery in the back room. Uh, let's have a look at exactly what that means for us. So we can still take shifts at the bar. We have an engineering job now. You'll need to cut Tala's tank down and turn it into a still and fermentation tub, as well as setting up the room for distilling. It's a big job. Uh, and it's, a, yeah, there's a lot of points on that clock, and it's risky. Not a good place to spend a two, I think. Uh, let's put this two into gathering data. Thank you. All right, three of the five we need. That said, we're also uh, going to be drawing some attention in the real near future. And let's go get some food, because I don't have a choice. You know, at this point, if ordering fungus again gets us completion of the uh, of the get to know emphasis drive, then doing this and the, doing this is still cheaper than just buying the doing this and then buying the vial is actually five cryo cheaper than just buying the vial. So we might this might end up being the drive that we complete. Although the Ripper Worm's going to finish tomorrow as well. Yeah, I don't know. A lot of stuff's going to happen. We'll, uh, we'll see how it goes. I sure would love that upgrade point, is all I'm saying. Yeah, ugly. Alright, well, let's see what's going on over at Fang's. As you arrive, Feng comes striding toward you, taking you by surprise. Let's go, sleeper. He puts a hand on your shoulder and turns you back the way you came. And I just follow his lead. He steps into the passageway, guiding you down ring toward the shipyard. Sorry for the hurry, but we have something of an opportunity. That data you ripped. Well, well done, by the way, he grins. Tells me Hardin is making a rare inspection of the sidereal horizon this cycle. It's the perfect chance to confront him outside of that compound he hides in. Fang takes a sharp turn onto a dimly lit side passage. Confront him. That's right. It's the perfect time. You know, it's baffling to me that he wouldn't have changed his name. Right? Wouldn't you change your name in the revolution? Like, if you were, like, part of an organization that was the target of a revolution, I don't know. I guess... He got away with it. Maybe he feels he feels there's no reason to be cautious. I'm sort of a paranoid person by nature. I think I would change my name. But the uh, but the point I'm making is I don't necessarily think that changing your name in that situation is paranoid. Anyway, not important. Fang slows and slips into a dark service tunnel where somewhere in the black a water pipe drips. It is him, sleeper. The same hardened Hurst. Our worm ripped out decades of records that mention him by name, an entire trail of documentation from the first days of the Solheim collapse until now. He wrote out the whole thing, slipped into Havenage when it first broke off from the Union. He paces in the tunnel, a hand rubbing at the back of his head. I need you to understand something about Solheim, sleeper. I don't know what you know about the collapse, but it wasn't as instant as it sounds. It wasn't like Solheim was here running the station one day and the next Erlen's Union took power. 
Now, back then, Solheim knew this place was slipping away from them. As the palladium market collapsed, they tried to keep the contractors here working. The pay got smaller and the costs higher, and people like my parents were forced to work non-stop just to keep a berth on the station and water in their tanks. Solheim squeezed every last worker until the mistakes, the accidents, were coming in non-stop. And as new waves of contractors came in desperate to work, Solheim welcomed them, taking bribes instead of checking pilot licenses. And the whole time Solheim was folding up, dragged into court cases in the central systems, while this severed limb of a station still desperately tried to take all it could. And the riots came after the collision at Dock 2. A young pilot, his MEV overloaded with palladium, miscalculated his trajectory and took out a section of the ring. And hundreds died, and thousands panicked. My parents told me people were terrified, and the blame fell sol uh, squarely on Solheim. You know, people like to tell stories about Erlin, how he brought the factions together, spoke to the crowds, turfed out Solheim, and maybe that's true, but my mother, pregnant with me, locked herself in their MEV and welded it to the dock while my father joined the improvised crews trying to seal up the ragged edges of the gap. And he never came back. Fang pauses in the dark. They sealed it up, though. And by the time they did, Solheim was gone, abandoning every one of us to the black. Apart, Fang finally turns to, back to you now, his eyes burning, from shits like Harden. Shits who have held their place, rode it out, and slipped into the new structure like nothing had changed, standing shoulder to shoulder with those they had exploited at every step. Fang starts walking again. That's why I can't just let him strut about the shipyard. This time, his past catches up with him. I mean, how's he still alive? Huh, clearly you don't know much about executives. That kind of power comes with certain... benefits. Fang rejoins the main passageway, which is now wide and glass-roofed. Through the ceiling, you can see ships in mid-construction, their flanks lit by the flashes of plasma torches. The entrance to the shipyard is ahead. This is... okay. I don't think... like, I don't think our character gives enough thought to consequence necessarily to think this is crazy. Like, we're, we're doing what we're... what we've been asked to do by somebody that we have some level of trust in. So, yeah, let's go. I am gung-ho. I am on the team. Head down, steps forward. Feng grins. Yeah, let's go show this shithead some consequences. He strides to the shipyard entrance and pushes through the doors. A web of corridors lead through the, compl uh, through the complex, snatches of the construction bays always appearing through windows. Ships are suspended like whale corpses. Skeletal. Imposing. Feng seems to know exactly where he is going, and before long you cross into a huge dry dock locked to one side of the sidereal horizon. A network of platforms and scaffolding cling to the ship's hull, filled with workers and equipment. The sound is stretched out by the vast space so that the welding and cutting and sealing seems to come from everywhere at once. Both you and Fang spot them at the same time, a group walking slowly across a gantry, and at the front, two men, one gesturing toward the ship and the other stick-thin, cleanly dressed, with a shock of gray hair. Harden. You and Feng say his name in unison, and Feng sets off up the staircase to the gantry, with you following behind. I don't know that this is a good... Our, like, I doubt our character would have a problem with it, but I personally think this is a terrible approach. This is the opposite of a plan. This is what the absence of a plan looks like. As you come to the same level, the group is passing... Uh, as you come to the same level, the group is passing closer the foreman gesturing to the work being done throughout the dock, and Hardin nodding along. This stuff, I will, I'll tell you this, this stuff would be easier to sight-read if they used their commas more correctly. Hardin Hurst! Feng shouts across the noise, taking you by surprise. His voice bounces and comes back in a rippling echo. The figures turn. Yes? Hardin asks, asks quizzically, raising an eyebrow. He glances between you and Feng, 
and you see his gaze linger on your body, unsure why a sleeper might be in this place. That's fair. You are a traitor, Hardin. A, tra a traitor. It's important to emphasize the T there. You are a traitor, Hardin. A Solheim executive who tried to hide here among its victims. Feng's voice is steady and strong. You stand for everything the Eye was rebuilt in the shadow of, against everything Erlin stood for, everything Havenage stands for. You have no place on this station. For a moment, stillness descends on the group, as if everyone was held in place by the rattle of construction. Hardin laughs. Well, good to meet you, too. He glances around at those around him. Some are smiling. The other's nervous. You're from the systems branch, are you not? Asks Hardin, inspecting Fang's clothing. Fang turns to the foreman. You need to call security. This man is a corporate agent. The foreman glances between Fang and Hardin, his hands drumming at his sides. Hardin leans toward him and says something inaudible. The foreman nods. I'm going to toss in. Hey, uh, it's true. I, I know this as well. As you begin speaking, Hardin turns its atten his attention to you. And what would a sleeper know about that? You accuse me of being a corporate agent. What are you, if not exactly that? He looks around the group, who are already eyeing you with suspicion. You are a product of SNARP. You have no place in a haven in shipyard. Who knows what signals you're sending back to your makers? A murmur of approval runs through the group. And honestly, I don't even know what the answer to that question is. Fang holds up a stick of memory. Yeah, you guessed right. I am Systems. And I have records that link you directly to Solheim. Right here. He turns to the foreman again. So, once again, I am asking you to take this man into the custody of the shipyard. The foreman remains still. Hardin's voice is calm and measured. If you have such data... Why hasn't it been submitted at a member's meeting for proper review? He shakes his head. Look, I have nothing to hide. Unlike a man who does not announce his name, who enters my shipyard with corporate property in tow, and tries to turn my own men against me. You hear it now. The echoing sound of boots on walkways, coming from all angles at once, and then settling behind you. Please, says Harden. Submit the data through the correct channels, then we can talk. For now, however, you must leave. He gestures behind you to the security detail, their hands on boxy black sidearms at their sides. That's exactly where those go. Good job. Fang spits. Harden, you shithead. You can't wriggle out of this one. A security officer draws their weapon and levels it. Fang turns and stares him down. I'm gonna... I'm gonna... Okay, Fang, buddy, we gotta get out of here. You look at Fang. He shakes his head and puts a hand on your shoulder. Let's go, says Fang, and he push, uh, as he pushes through security, heading back down the walkway. Once security has walked you out of the shipyard and nudged you back into the corridor, Fang picks up pace. You try to keep up as he slips into the shadows of an entrance. Fang is grinning ear to ear. You know, sleeper? Sometimes people are exactly how you expect them to be. Something pings in his pocket, and he takes it out. On the slate, a web of connections starts drawing itself out, stretching to a set of points around the ring. Got him. What's going on? Harden is doing what any sneaky shithead always does, calling his friends. We're tracking his outgoing messages. Feng's grin looks ghostly in the uplight of his screen. The old ways are best. You spook them good enough and they'll give the game away. He jabs at the, at the slate, and you see the web is being drawn over a map of the ring, lines bouncing from point to point. All these dots? These are Hardin's buddies, the ones he's messaging right now. We are going to find them all. Oh, that whole thing was on purpose. Well, of course. Hardin isn't working alone. We need the full set or nothing. Feng glances around and slips the slate back into his pocket. All right, we better split for now, sleeper, but this is exactly what we needed. Good hunting. With a pat on your shoulder, Feng drifts away, back into the flow of people around the shipyard entrance. 
You watch him go, unsure whether to be angry or impressed. Okay, well, there's my upgrade point. That's handy. Uh, he did not fix our tracker, so angry, I think, is, is the correct call. Uh, so you can get as high as plus two to a skill, but that's another three points after the two-point perk. So obviously, uh, that's the kind of thing that I expect it's going gonna, it's gonna to have to wait. So, we have Ethan's tab to deal with pretty soon. Um, I think let's go ahead and buy the vial of stabilizer, which we can just barely afford. I have to rotate the map so the compressor club thing is not over the top of it. Because uh, having five dice tomorrow is going to make it a lot easier to actually make the money we need to pay the tab. As you quickly leave the surgery, uh, eager to be away from Toshiro's glare, you notice something wrapped around the stabilizer vial clutched tightly in your hand. You open your hand and a thin film marked with holes and sigils unrolls from around the vial. At one end, it has a hard metal strip, a handle. Let's inspect that handle. The metal handle is worn and pitted, but you can see a set of numbers imprinted into it. 207F and then, crudely scratched into the handle, at some later date, low end. All right, and the film itself? You hold the cloudy film up to the light. It is perforated with an ornate pattern of holes. You can make out a word among the markings. Pass key. Is this an entry key for somewhere? For a moment, you consider going back to the surgery to return the key, and then quickly think better of it. Did Sabine want you to have this, or is Toshiro passing on a message? Guess you're going to have to head to the low end to find out. Okay, and I'm totally going to do that. That's also a drive point. Um, I don't know what we're going to do with this one. Probably buy another perk, right? I don't think it makes sense to push engage any harder. We could zero out our intuit. Um... Chance to gain random scrap item on engineer actions, or chance to gain cryo on interface actions. I think these are both interesting. Random, like, random scrap is useful, right? It's money, it's trust at the market. Little bits of cryo here and there definitely add up. I think this is a little bit more significant. Every single time this fires, you're going to feel it. Let's take that even though i don't necessarily do all that much engineering work we can we can fix that you know um and then i'm immediately going to go do some interfacing stuff but like we got these ones and twos right we can get ourselves to two and four on our data types and i think that's good enough we have energy we're not going to be able to make good money with a one and a two and tomorrow we're going to have a full five dice to deal with um to try to work on the um, what's his name's tab, I think I think this is the right thing to do. Let's pull a little bit more data. And then, of course, deal with this. A glimmer in the dark catches your eye as the orb of Hunter's head appears in the distance. It is looking for you, and I just try not to be here anymore. You turn away and glide back into the cloud, threads of data rushing past. Another glimmer catches your eye, closer now, that roving orb wreathed in tentacles. It flickers, jumps once, twice, and then it is here. Hunter is here. Entity, submit to inquiry. Hunter reaches for you in that unpleasantly familiar way, its weaving threads creating a cage. And I struggle, because that's the only button I'm allowed to press. You push against the threads as they close in, becoming frenzied as you push them aside. You are caught by whipping tendrils and feel them pulling you away from the anchor of your body. You push through, clearing the threads. Entity, hold for processing, comes the scream from behind, but you are already gliding away, back to your anchor, your body. You awake, dizzy, distorted, but safe. For the moment, at least.
All right, one more two, and we get a ship mined. Feels like a pretty significant thing. All right, so let's have a rest here, and then we'll figure out... Oh, sorry, I should definitely inject my stabilizer before I sleep. There we go. All right, let's roll some dice. I have six cryo. We just need to make enough to cover Ethan's tab. No big deal. Okay, that's a pretty strong roll. The compressor is quiet today. The usual crowds are elsewhere and the pumping music washes over a handful of spacers and a few drunks. Ethan is still in the same stool, in the same pool of light. His head is low, close to the bar, and the bartender is ignoring him. <sighs> if I just leave now, he's going to hunt me down later and make it a big deal. Let's, let's just deal with it. As you get closer, he lifts his head and turns. Sleeper, he turns to look at you. Time to pay up again, is it? He gestures to the bartender. Hey, come here. Take their chits. I'm going to stay silent. He hasn't, like... I don't think in this moment he has pissed us off enough for us to be, like, you know, um, spitting back at him. I'm just going to... I'm just going to stay quiet. Wait for... Wait to be told the bill. The bartender ignores Ethan. Seems they've cut him off. Hey! He slams a hand on the bar. Come take the chits! The bartender ignores him. Ethan lets out a huge sigh, rubbing his eyes with his palms. He reaches toward his holster. His elbow slips, and the gun tumbles out. It clatters on the bar and falls to the floor, bouncing onto the ground between you. Both you and the bartender look at the gun. Stare at it. Butterfingers, says Ethan, and puts out a hand, beckoning for you to give him the gun back. If you would. The bartender looks at you warily. You crouch down and pick up the gun. And I mean, I pointed at him. Of course I pointed at him. Ethan turns his head in your direction a little, a sharp, pale eye locking with yours. The bartender backs away. Oh, he turns on the stool. Oh, sleeper. He stands. Now this is more like it. The thing is, I'm starting to like... I'm starting to find a place... I don't think you can shoot Ethan. I think the gun's empty. But our character doesn't know that. And so I'm trying to like work this out from our character's point of view. Like, we're starting to find a place here. We've made... Some connections, you know, Tala is like a real friend. If I shot him and then disappeared into the Greenway, we'd probably get away with it. You know what? Impulsive enough, I think the char I think this character pulls the trigger. You don't wait. You pull the trigger. The gun clicks. By now, all the attention in the bar is on you and Ethan, who looks at his gun with a bemused expression. The bartender raises an open hand. And in it are ten shiny bullets. Ten shiny bullets he took out of Ethan's gun while he was asleep on the bar. Ethan smiles at the bartender. Oh well, he says, and grabs the gun, slamming it back into your face in a single move. You stagger back and drop to a knee. Somewhere nearby, the gun clatters onto a surface. The hit's a glancing blow, but it makes your vision swim. Through the blur, you see Ethan wrestle a small, thin slate from his belt and hold it up. Enough of this. I'm logging the job and calling it in. Ethan taps at the slate. No more playing. Your head aches. Ethan taps through a few screens impatiently. He swears and taps again. He starts shouting, a dull echo to your ringing ears. He starts screaming at the slate and throws it across the bar. He crouches down and grabs you by the chin, his face close, his breath heavy with drink. S and Arp just screwed me, he grins maniacally. They canceled the contract. He stands up. They canceled the contract, he shouts at the ceiling of the compressor. 
You stand up, struggling to your feet, the sting of the hit fading. Ethan is rubbing his temples, his face pale. You hear a clicking sound, like coins being counted, like bullets being loaded into a magazine. When you shake off the last, uh, the last of the blur, the bartender has Ethan's pistol trained on Ethan's head. Ethan stumbles back toward the middle of the room, all eyes trained on him. I'll kill all of you, he screams. He stumbles into the wall, spinning away toward the door. I'll be back for that, he shouts at the bartender and lunges out of the compressor. You steady yourself on the bar and catch your breath. The rumble of conversation returns. The bartender goes to say something, but then thinks better of it and begins to clean the bar. After a while, you wander out into the light of the bright market, looking for Ethan around every corner. So we have a new clock here. Ethan may be disarmed, but you doubt you've seen the last of him, and for some reason we know exactly how long it's going to take for that vendetta to come to its fall. In any case, don't have to worry about that anymore. That's pretty rad. Um, and we're good on stabilizer for a minute. This might be a good time to, uh, to do some of our tasks with our very high rolls. So we can help Ankita out. This is not my most primary concern. We, of course, have the engineer actions for the bar. What, is, what does that look like again? We don't know exactly how many. Let's, let's throw a six on this and see what, see what the positive outcome looks like. Okay, two, two pips. So there's still kind of a lot to go, actually. Um, hmm. All right, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to work a shift at the bar. We're going to see if we get energy from this. And if we don't, I'm going to go buy mushrooms from Emphis. Because, actually, I'm not going to use a five for this. We're going to use a five. We're going to use the three. Okay. So no, no free energy. So we're going to go buy the last set of mushrooms from Emphis to, um, to finish the Emphis drive. Oh yeah. There's unit 207, right? That's a thing to do. Um, cause I think this is going to give us another point and the, this upgrade point being put into engineering allows us to really like smash the heck out of uh, out of fixing that tank up. All right, let's start the action. The action of devouring delicious fungus. Sleeper, Emphis calls out to you, a booming voice that echoes through the corridor. Tell me a story. He throws a handful of chopped mushrooms into his into his walk the fire leaping up to meet the oil. You know, I see you. Cycle in, cycle out. But we never speak. So tell me a story. Okay, what kind? Any kind. He pauses to drizzle something from a, a plastic bottle into the walk. But one of yours. He looks up at you. Nothing stolen. You pause, the spices rich in your nostrils, and think about the kind of story you'd like to tell Emphis. You look at Emphis, the listener, and imagine he's heard it all before. But perhaps he would enjoy a strange story, something with some spice. Uh, you know, we're going to tell him something from our dreams. I don't know that I think this character is great at, like, just inventing a thing. All the sleepers, you tell Emphis, had dreams. Some were simple, memories left over from the emulation process that had become tangled up in their minds and would come out when they slept. It wasn't rare to hear a sleeper in the dorm scream or cry out in the night. But your dreams, those gray skeletal afterimages of systems and structures, of threads and patterns, weren't like the others. They weren't memories or nightmares. They were reflections of reality, distorted, yes, but somehow true. You learned back then to keep quiet about them, to let them flow through your mind like water. That was until now, until you arrived in this place. 
Now your dreams colonize your waking life. They slip behind your eyelids with every blink. And now you understand they aren't dreams at all, but some process of interfacing, of speaking, of living in another world that flows through this one like smoke through air. You tell him that you do not know if there is a reason for your dreams. Perhaps, you reason, that it's just some side effect or particular quality of the frame you inhabit. But whatever it is, it is a gift, and you hope to make use of it. Emphis finishes cooking and squints a little at you. Sleeper, he smiles, you are quite the storyteller. He eyes you and you realize he's trying to gauge how honest you have been in your story. Emphis passes you the meal he has cooked, and you take it gratefully. As you eat, he talks, a natural exchange. Thank you, sleeper. He looks around at the emptying market. My time is done for today, and I don't want to keep you longer, so I'll make a proposal. He gestures to the plastic boxes of ingredients stacked behind his stall. You know, these are good enough for most, but someone told me a story that made me think a couple of cycles ago. They said that across the gap in the Greenway, fresh mushrooms grow. You heard this? Yeah, you know, I think I know something about that. Then you already know what I want to ask. Emphis begins packing up his things. Can you bring me some? I can't cross the gap. I worry about leaving my things behind. He smiles. I'm sure a storyteller like you could handle the trip. I'll prepare them for you and, if you wish to tell it, be the audience for another story. Yeah, okay. Good, booms Emphis. Then I'll wait for you to bring them. Emphis slides his walk away and straightens up. I'll prepare a recipe then, sleeper. Good luck with your foraging. You turn away and walk back into the main market the rich taste of Emphasis food still lingering in your mouth. Stories for food, you think. A trade that seems more than fair. Alright, there's a lot of mushroom stuff going on in our life. Uh, so we can continue to get this, but also we bring some garol and uh, he'll make us a, a fricassee. So okay, we don't get a drive for just that part. We have to we have to help him make his other recipes before we get a point. That's a shame. Well, we may as well check this out. You find the entrance to the apartment, its passkey symbol obscured beneath layers of graffiti. Who lives here? It's so weird that things often fail to go into the slot the first time. As you push the door open, the automatic lights flicker on inside the apartment. They reveal yellowing plastic panels, the curved shape of wall-mounted utility units, the detritus of a routine life arranged on every surface. You step inside, clicking the door shut behind. The amber light of the aging fixtures glaze everything with a pale orange. The work surfaces hold a variety of objects, indistinct in the dull lighting. A pale blue light drifts from a doorway at the end of the room. What's in there? You cross the cramped utility room with its auto wash, dispensers, water closet toward the doorway. Through the doorway is a dark, warm room lit only by the faint glow of a terminal screen. And what is on the screen? As you approach, there is a crackle from somewhere in the dark. Sleeper. Sabine's voice shakily echoes through the apartment. Welcome to my home. I'm sorry I can't be there. I've had to make alternate arrangements. You hear rattling noises. Static. I was able to record this message, but I don't dare show my face. Something is happening within Yadagan. I no longer trust them. Their voice becomes distant, slipping behind the background noise. I have something to ask of you. I want you to get me out. Yet again, we're supposed to hide me, to protect me. After everything happened, I was desperate. And then after that, I was too tired to care. A noise, like waves, passes over the recording. But I'm done with them now. I want out. Screw the debt. But I need insurance. Something I can hold against them. 
I have my suspicions, but, but I can't be sure. I need information. And, as you know, you need me. A pause. Something clicking in the dark. Look, th this isn't a threat. You have to understand my position here. Another pause. Look, I know sleepers. I've been here before. I, I can help you, but not with Yadigan's noose around my neck. You get me data. Get me information. Get me something that I can use against them. Then I can get out, and you can get what you need. Please. Waves of static cut into Sabine's voice. Just bring it here to my terminal. I'll get to it when I can. You look around the tiny room and try to imagine Sabine living here. Working at the desk, sleeping in the bunk, blinking into the terminal in the dark. The recording cuts to static, filling the room with its white hiss. And then, silence. Well, of course I'm going to access the term. I mean, I'm going to try to look, right? You sit in front of the humming terminal and hit a few keys. Sabine has left an access port open, but the rest is encrypted, locked away behind passcodes. It seems Sabine might not trust you as much as they want you to think. I don't know. I feel like this is exactly the amount that, that uh, was sort of projected from the message. Who does Sabine need to hide from? And what debt do they owe to Yadagon? You try to assemble the pieces, but too many are still missing. The only thing you know is that without Stabilizer, your body will die. You glance at the briefcase lab on the desk, its glassware glinting in the dark. You turn away and leave, the door clunking shut behind you. Back in the corridor, you notice the, you notice the scrawled graffiti of a blade on the opposite wall. Yet again... You feel yourself being drawn into something you don't quite understand. Well, I mean, there's a lot of that going around, right? So, we can come here and drop off data. Sabine might be able to bargain for their freedom, which might result in us getting a stabilizer. Uh, Alright, I'm going to think about that. And or maybe go back and watch the old series and uh, <laughs> see if there is stabilizer at the end of that train because like we do need the stabilizer right building the still is important but so is so is clearing the aviary wait this is the thing you know it's the it's the one that's marked the aviary yeah let's let's knock out a bunch of progress on this we can force a couple of positives here and then potentially get lucky and get another one and wipe this out today. All right, 50-50. Once a corporate garden for impressing guests with gene-tweaked birds. Let's turn it into something useful. Oh, of course we get the neutral. You struggle with dried vines and creepers entwined around the structure of the dome threatening to vent the garden into space. Alright, we can just rest here. It's fine, I suppose. And that is definitely enough dice to get something done. Here, I'm going to throw a one... Well, actually, maybe I'm not going to throw one at this... Yadagan data is all of a sudden, like, really valuable. Well, I mean, not all of a sudden, but all of a sudden even more in, uh, in need than it was before. You know what? Maybe right here, this is exactly where we call it for today. I get to think a little bit about how I want to move forward on the stabilizer problem. Uh, and then beyond that, we still have all of our various mushroom problems. It is kind of interesting that all of our, like, all of the issues we're having are sort of zeroing in on this one particular thing. We just need so, so many Garol caps. Uh, all right, that's going to be it for us for today, though. Thank you all so much for watching. When you return, we're going to see if we can't develop a green thumb, or at least whatever color your thumbs turn when you find mushrooms that have already grown in places. That's a thing, right? And we'll see you then.